Good morning, church. So good to be with you on a Sunday morning. If you have a Bible, love for you to turn with me. Do you know where we're going to turn? Daniel 9. You even know the chapter. Wow, that's, that's impressive. Daniel chapter 9 is where we'll be this morning in God's Word. I'm going to be um, reading and primarily teaching from a translation known as the New Living Translation. Not unfamiliar to you if you've been here for a while. Um, it's a thought-for-thought thought translation that, you know, full transparency. Why do you teach out of the New Living Translation? Well, I like a thought-for-thought thought translation, but you may have never seen this. This is the introduction to my Bible, handwritten by C.C. Spencer. She's adding to the Bible. we got to check on her, see if she's doing okay. <laughs> but she, she gifted me this Bible right before I stepped into the current role that I'm in with our church as the pastor. And so I like that Bible. It's got C.C.'s handwriting in it. But I also really appreciate a thought-for-thought thought translation. Word-for-word for word is phenomenal. It should be your primary source of study, in my opinion. Um, but when you're considering a sermon, when you're considering a devotional time, when you're considering even a text like the one before us today, a thought for thought is very helpful. It puts it in very much language that you and I are accustomed to. Um, so Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 19, is our hope, our intention, our desire, our mission this morning to spend time in God's Word. And here's what I tell my kids. You know, we as a family... We watch the daily in the word devotional uh, most weekday mornings. And we go around the room and I ask, okay, kids, what are we here to do? Leo, I'm starting with you. Dad, we're here to listen. Oh, good. Liam, why are we here to listen? To learn. Good job, Liam. Layla, to learn to do what? To love like Jesus. That's good, Layla. Lucy, why else? To live like Jesus. That's good. Lily, why else? To lead like Jesus. And then I'll say this. So that you're not a loser. <laughs> so that you're not lame. So that you're not loco. So that you're not lost. Did you get all those L's? I like L's. Specifically, Lily, Lucy, Layla, Liam, Leo, and Lainey. Um, well, this is my hope that this is why you're here, to listen to God's Spirit through times of communion, times of prayer, times of fellowship, times where you actually give of your first fruits, times where you serve. Have you picked up, and I haven't even mentioned a sermon yet, that's not the entirety of the purpose of the church gathered. There's ten reasons we've gathered this morning. We will operate in eight of them. Actually, nine of them. We won't baptize this morning. But the other nine we'll do. You say, what are those? What are you talking about? Uh, well, you can figure it out. Well, today we're in Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. And in the series that we're trying to focus our time and attention in this series is simply this, control and chaos. Listen, let me share this with you. Life can feel out of control. Anyone ever felt that way? Anyone ever lived through a different administration in America once or twice or ten times? It can feel out of control. It is. Life is chaos, and it's not. Life is riddled by the impact of sin, and God is in control. You see, at times, things can sense and be generally and genuinely chaotic, out of my control. And so what does one desire to do when things are out of control? Let me take control. Isn't that our desire? Let me share this with you, though. It's not our goal to be in control, but to have self-control because we know who is in control. My desire is not to be in control. My desire is to live self-controlled because I know him. Because I know him and I trust him. That's it. It's like what Paul told Titus. Let me put this on the screen for you. 
For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. That sounds like self-control. While we look forward with optimism. No, not optimism. There's a difference between hope and optimism. Oftentimes, church is built on optimism. It must be built on hope. Those are two different kinds of churches. Forward with the hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. This is what that looks like. Paul says in Galatians, the Holy Spirit produces. This is, this is the job of the Spirit, not your job, not my job. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. What? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How do you know if someone's got the Spirit of God working in their life? Because the Spirit of God shows up and that's what he looks like. It's not you white-knuckling self-control. You know, I used to live at the Goonie house. It was the first house my wife and I ever bought. You say the Goonie house? Yeah. It was on Rangoon Cove. So I called it the Goonie house. And at the Goonie house, there were so many citrus trees. So many that we had pests that rhyme with mats, but I won't tell you what they were. They were everywhere in that backyard. They love citrus. Citrus would just fall to the ground all the time. So many bags of citrus we would give away to like local pantries that wanted fruit. And um, I never walked out there, never once in my life at the Goonie house. I never stepped in that backyard and heard this noise from one of those citrus trees. <laughs> trying to produce fruit. It never happened. I never once saw that. I never heard it. I didn't experience that. When I went out there, the, uh, the thing was just planted in the ground, lots of water, lots of sunshine, and fruit just happened. And here's one thing I've learned. The deeper the root, the stronger the root. The more time focused on the root, eventually, the greater capacity to hold lots of fruit. But you and I should focus on roots, not fruit. Because God is the one that produces someone who's loving. You know how I know that? Me. I'm not a loving person. I know me. I know me. I will never forget one Father's Day where my wife asked my three oldest daughters, what do you think about Dad? I will never forget this. Dad is kind. I thought, wow, that's what I would call a miracle. <laughs> and the greatest um, accolade? I have yet to receive from three little girls that actually live with me, <laughs> actually see me, actually know me, and would say, you know what I think about dad? He's kind. That's amazing. That's the proof in my life that God exists. What? Me. <laughs> you can take someone that's lame and lost and a loser and loco and turn him into someone that's kind? That's impressive, God. I can't do that. See, here's the deal. We live self-controlled because we know that he is in control. Now today, have, any, has any, did you, have you ever read Daniel chapter 9? Anyone ever been exposed to it once or twice? A lot of us haven't. Okay. Well, this is the Bible, and today we're going to be in the ninth chapter. It's going to be awesome. But the ninth chapter is powerful. It's filled with both a focus on prayer and prophecy. Today, in respect of your time and attention, we are only going to focus on the prayer. Next week, Pastor John will focus on the prophecy. 
And here's how we'll spend our time this morning. You've heard me share this before. When we read through Daniel chapter 9, just the first little bit, the first 19, uh, you've heard me say this. This isn't a phrase that I own. I heard it from somebody else. We're going to leave a lot of gold on the ground as it relates to all that is in this chapter. You could spend years in the book of Daniel and still be scratching the surface of all that's here. We have 30 minutes together. This is a sermon, not a class. So we will kind of focus on a little bit of what God says here to us on Cinco de Mayo 2024 in regards to prayer. Now, I'm going to use words that the Bible uses to describe prayer. I thought about making them rhyme, making them start with the letter L, but I thought, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use Bible words, words that the Bible uses so that when you come across them, you go, I know what that is. We study that in church. Not Christianese. You know Christianese? Christianese like, well, God put a hedge of protection around them. Can you imagine what someone that's never prayed, a hedge of protection? These people are all about bushes at the church. Why do they want a hedge? You ever heard someone say that? Or, Lord, I, I plead the blood. What the? You plead blood? Like, what does that mean? Like, like these are, this is like Christianese, that if you're part of the club, you understand what they mean. But if you're not, you're kind of like, what in the world? Blood and bushes, these people are nuts. Like, so I'm not going to use Christianese, but I'm going to use four words. Rob already mentioned them this morning. Praise, confession, intercession, and glory. P-C-I-G. Praise, confession, intercession, and glory. And here is my hope. Bubbles and building blocks. See, what do you mean? Jesus said something very interesting about prayer. He said, my house shall be called a house of what, church? Prayer. Prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer. I think many of us think of prayer a little bit more like bubbles, like this. Let's see if this works. I'd say it works. I think many of us, when we offer prayer, we go, God, here, help, here, listen. Oh, it's gone, it's popped. Oh, God, let me just throw this up there real quick. I think when we... Think about prayer. I'll never forget when John Corson said, Neil, this today is like a Tuesday or something. We're actually going to get work done in prayer. We're going to be spending four hours together. It's like four hours in prayer. That's insane. How do you do that? Like um, Jesus said this, my house oops, shall be called a house of prayer. Now, I know everybody can't see this, but this is a little house. I think we should look as the elements of prayer more like building blocks than bubbles. That, God, I'm going to praise you. 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 I'm going to confess, 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 intercede, 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 and recognize that this is about your glory even more than it is my good. And as I start to live with a mindset like that, this is not my life. This is a life that has an element of solidity to it, a prayer life that actually is getting things done. Again, I don't have time to explain all that to you, but in the next 25 minutes or so, I would like to walk through Daniel chapter 9 verses 1 through 19, and share with you how these four elements, praising God, praising God, confessing to God, interceding on behalf of others, and praying for God's glory, and then going for it, will lend itself towards a life that stays controlled in the midst of chaos. Does that make sense? That's our goal this morning. Hopefully you're listening and learning so you don't turn out to be a loser, right? Or lame or loco. But did you learn? You learn how to love. You learn how to live. You learn how to lead. Just like, and I always ask Lainey. She's my last one. Who, who are we trying to be like, Lainey? Jesus. Yeah, that'll work. Jesus. She's two. She's getting there. Father, I pray as we step into this text, 
Lord, you'd help me to serve your people well. And Lord, that we would spend time listening and learning to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me just read the first three verses of Daniel 9. It was the first year of the reign of Darius, the Mede, the son of Asherus, who became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word. <laughs> you see that? He learned. I learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. Daniel begins to pray. Well, he does in verse 4. But in verse 1 through 3, we get a little bit of, I guess you could say, context to what's happening in the text before us. Now, if you're one that likes to benefit from printed notes, one of the things that we do at Coastline is I'll share with you at the table just the notes that are in front of me, and we'll put them online later. But that's also so that I don't have to stick to them. Does that make sense? Like, if you want to read it later, you got more content there. But for now, what I would like to say is this. He is reading the Bible, and what happens? He learns something. Whoa! 70 years, we're supposed to be in captivity. If he had an Apple Watch that went off when Siri is reading the Bible, it's like he, it would have said, time's almost up. It's almost up. So he prays, and listen what's going to happen in verse 4. He starts to begin to pray. Look at verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, you are great. You are awesome, O God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. His prayer is directed by what he learned. See, his prayer wasn't like this. Oh, God. Um, let me just throw some prayers up real quick. No, 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 no. His nose was in the book. And then when his knees hit the floor, he's building something. Does that make sense? It's not like this uneducated prayer. I love what David Guzik said. It's not that God gets more glory from an ignorant ministry. Some would say, well, you know, it's all the Lord. Yes, that's true. But have you heard that illustration my father gives about the farmer? The farmer who has this like lush, beautiful garden and farm just producing so much fruit. All the lines are just perfect. And, and someone comes to the farmer and says, man, isn't God good? Yes, the farmer says, yes, he is. Look at what God's given you. Oh, I know. You should have seen what it looked like when God had it by himself. <laughs> Does that make sense? Many lives are like that, undisciplined. Undisciplined. Did you know that the root word of disciple is discipline? Why are we disciplined? To get God's favor? No, because we have it. And we realize that there's work to be done. Do you know that there are thousands of people within 325636166, whatever zip code you're in, that are living like they're dead. They don't know Jesus. They don't have any sense of forgiveness in their life. They live in shame. They don't know what it's like to walk in freedom. They have no hope. There's no future for them. And for those that are alive and that have an element of a heart, what can I do? How can I be a part of what you want done, God? That's Daniel. Daniel's in a tight spot. You've read the book. We're in chapter 9. You know what's happened in his life so far. Not all roses and rainbows for Daniel. God wasn't there to meet his emotional needs primarily. Judgment was coming. Seventy years. Daniel reads this. And he recognizes, my goodness, we're almost done. So he begins to pray. And listen to me. I want to share this with you. You may ask this question. Why didn't Daniel just read and go, oh, cool, it's going to happen. Give me a rocking chair. I'll just watch. God has said he's going to do it. So I'm just going to hang out, right? Two things to consider. 
Prayer is actually cooperation with God. It's aligning your will with his. And through prayer, this is what Daniel is saying. God, I want to be a part of what you're doing. I want to enter in and cooperate with you. And listen to me. God invites you to do that right now. Right now. Daniel enters into the purpose of God on his life through prayer. And also, God gives him further insight. You see what? Daniel just did what he knew to do. I'm going to read the Bible and pray. God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to be one that when I see you doing something, I want to join you in that. I'm not going to sit on my thumbs waiting for position, waiting for a personal invitation. God, I, I see this as your invitation to join you in your great commission. What is your will, God? How can my life see that it's done? That is the proper perspective as a Christian. Not God. What is your will for my life? Do you see how egocentric that is? No wonder you're miserable and living on a cul-de-sac. Maybe this job. Maybe this spouse. Maybe this location. Maybe this car. Maybe this. No. What is your will? How can I see that it's done? Ah, now you're going forward. You're off the cul-de-sac. And here's what I find so interesting. Don't know what to do? Get in line. Do what you know to do. How can you say that? Because look at what happens in verse 4. When Daniel was a man who was committed to do what he knew to do, God gave him more revelation of things that he didn't know, things there were no way that he could know. For Daniel, knowing God was everything. Please, in all humility, let me ask you to be honest with yourself. Is knowing God the master passion of your life? If not, then just be honest. He's not God. Because that's what God is, the master passion of your life. But you and I, we have something in common. We were all conceived and born. Do any of us have that in common? It's not just that, though. You are CBS. You were conceived, born, and then shaped immediately from the womb. The family you were born into, the culture that surrounded you, and the stories that you were sold have shaped you. They've shaped every Haitian. They've shaped every Ugandan. They've shaped every single person from Chamukla and Pensacola. You and I are CBS. We have that in common. Some of us have A, B, and C in common and NBC. Some of us have reached a place in our life where we have admitted that Jesus Christ is Lord, believed in our heart that he is our Savior and confessed him as such. And therefore, we have become newborn creatures. Some of us, we have that in common, not all of us. And then some of us still have discovery in common, where we have discovered, God, this is how you've wired me. This is how you've gifted me. Therefore, I want to disciple under you. I want to develop under you. And Lord, I want you to deploy me wherever you desire. CBS, ABC, NBC, Discovery. These are all streaming platforms. You want to live the stream, the dream of whatever you're most interested in, the tennis channel, home and shopping, whatever it is, however God's wired you. Recognize that you've been shaped. And maybe ask, has my shaping, the stories I've been told, the culture I'm around, and the family I was born into, does it align with this? This should be your primary shaper. A friend of mine used to tell me this, Neil, do not be afraid to think outside the box but never outside the book. But those who are able to think outside the box but with inside the book will change the world. And that can be you. I wish there was a church that loved you enough every day to take you through God's Word with a reading plan and a video devotional and was building a website so that you could go to every single book of the Bible and find resource instantaneously. 
Don't you wish there was a church that cared that much for you? I would go to that church. I think that'd be awesome. But here's what happens. Verse 1 through 3, he gets a sense of what's happening. So what does he begin to do? Look at verse 4. I pray to the Lord my God and I confess. He begins to pray. And through his prayer, he begins to praise. He says, God, you're great. You're awesome. You're faithful. God, your unfailing love, it's so big. And let me say this about praise. Praise pushes our problems into its proper perspective. That's what praise does. Anyone ever taken their hands? You know, I have a two-year-old. You know what little Lanny Pearl will do? She does this right here. Can't see me, Dad. Can't see me, Dad. That's true. I can't. Well, well, yeah. She can't see me. That's more the right thing. But I think maybe sometimes with problems, this is where we are. I can't see you, Dad. I can't see you, Dad. I can't see you, Dad. And if you begin to praise God, you'd be able to go, look at how small those are. But see, our problems become our filter, not praise. But praise is that which pushes our problems into proper perspective. Does that make sense? You can get a master's degree in praise if you should so choose. It's accessible to you. And it'll change your life. If you're someone who will enter his courts with thanksgiving, enter his gates with praise. I may have had that mixed up. And I, I don't remember. You, you study the Bible. You let me know. But we shouldn't be spending our time telling our God how big our problems are, but spending our time telling our problems how big our God is. Daniel does not approach his problems with God. Do you know about this? Do you hear what she said? Do you see what he's doing? Do you see how this is coming up? Praise. 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 Jesus gives us a similar insight of setting perspective right by saying this, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. What if you started every day like that? God, you're in the drone. You see everything. And you know what, God? You're good. What if days started with praise? Perhaps you wouldn't be so porcupiney so salty, such a drainer. Say, what do you mean by that? Porcupiney. You know what that is. I mean, they got a lot of good points. But nobody wants to be around them. <laughs> or like, you know, a drainer. Oh, there's the te- this person's going to drain for me. It's always going to be the problem. Always going to be the problem. Drainers or dreamers are two types of people in the world. When you see them, you're like, I don't want to talk to that guy. Praise. Praise pushes our problems into proper perspective. And here's what I found, Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter his courts with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, gates and courts of the tabernacle, the presence of God. It begins with thanksgiving and praise. Can I just ask you a question, all humility? Is that how Sunday morning started for you? Like, did you get up and go, okay, before my feet hit the floor, God, you're worthy of more of me today than anything else. You're good. You're faithful. Listen. Listen. Listen to me. You talk to yourself more than anyone else talks to you. You do. So what you should do is tell yourself the right stuff. Chuck Smith used to say this. The battle of the flesh and the spirit is waged on the warfare of the mind. It's not your circumstances. It's not your problem. It's your mindset. You need to train. Not live to be entertained. Circus and bread. That's what Caesars used to say about the mob. That's how we control them. Circus and bread, circus and bread, circus and bread. Streaming in calories. The next thing to buy. You know what I found out about people that own islands? I've met some people that own islands. Did you know there's someone that owns two islands? A guy that owns three? But here's the point. You may own an island. God bless you. But it never ends. You finally get whatever it is you're looking to get, and you realize, well, that guy's got two of them. Oh, okay. It never ends. Stop living for that which gratifies and start living for that which satisfies. He moves from praise into confession. Let me read to you verses 5 through 15. If you're in the book of Daniel, let me know by saying, control in chaos. Okay, let me read verses 5 through 15. Now, this is a large portion of Scripture. 
Out of respect for God's word, can I ask you to stand with me as I read verses 5 through 15? Verse 5, here's what, this is gnarly. It's going to like hit you right between the nose, um, is that, or between the eyes. Between the nose would be a little awkward, but between the eyes. Here it is, verse 5. Listen to what he says, this is so gnarly. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, listen to what he says. You are in the right. But as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel scattered near and far wherever you've driven us because of our disloyalty to you. O oh Lord, we and our kings and princes and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. Even though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the Lord, for we have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of our sin. You've kept your word. You, done, you have done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Never has there been such a disaster as happened in Jerusalem. Things are bad. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing this truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us the disaster he prepared. The Lord our God was right to do all the things, for we did not obey him. Our Lord, our God, you've brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. You can have a seat. We've talked about praise, now confession. You know, the clearer you see your Savior, the greater you sense your own sin. When you see how good God is, like, Lord, it's like Isaiah chapter 6. Woe is me. When, when he saw the king high and the, the, the Lord seated on the throne, king of the universe, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. It's not like you're going to get to heaven one day and say, God, i got a lot of questions for you. Every wrong that's happened in my life, I need, I need some answers. No. When you stand before God, you're going to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like Peter when he was with Jesus. And remember, they didn't catch anything. And this carpenter who doesn't work with fish, who deals with rocks as a stonemason, a carpenter at that time frame, he says, hey, didn't catch anything? How about you go out and cast your nets on the other side? <laughs> Can you imagine a professional fisherman taking advice from a rock guy? Did you try the other side of the boat? And what? Peter said, you know, Lord, at your word, I'm going to do it. You know the story. The boat starts to sink because there's so many fish that come in. And what does it say in Luke chapter 5? What is Peter's response? I got to clean all these fish and sell them. I just made a huge profit. You know what he says? Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. When you see God accurately, you're not proud. When you meet someone who's full of self, it's because they're not full of God. They don't see him accurately. Men that struggle with pride... Do not know God intimately. Not daily. It's very hard to be filled with self if you're constantly being presented with who God accurately is. That's not the biblical thing is like, gosh, if I see who God is, I want to see myself accurately. That is the true etymology of the word humility. It's not to think low of yourself, it's to see things accurately. That's what humility is. To see things as they are. And as believers, here's who we are. We're separated from God. Worthy of his judgment. But Jesus took our place. Therefore, we are his sons and daughters. Do you see the dichotomy there? I see that apart from Jesus, I, I, I'm a sinner. What I deserve, what's my rights, what's coming to me? H-E double hockey sticks. That's what's coming to me. But because of Jesus, I don't walk with my head low. I walk with my head up because I'm a king's kid, because I've been forgiven, because I've been set free. 
Do you see the balance there? You see accurately who you were and who you are. That's the true essence of humility. And here's the beautiful thing about Daniel's confession. Daniel identifies with his people. Thirteen times Daniel uses the word we. Eighteen times our. Nine times the word us. There are 40 personal pronouns with confession. You ever been around someone when something happened that wasn't supposed to happen and they kind of like, well, it was this person. Well, it was that. Oh, they didn't. Oh, 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 I've been trying, but oh, 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 oh. You ever been around someone like that? That's not confession. That's, that's like, what do they call that? Not reflection, but like, yeah, deflection. Yeah, that's right. They're just trying to deflect. They don't want the spotlight on them. What does Daniel do? Put it on me, God. We all did this. Confession. Confession, confession. He owns it. And he mentions this dynamic of shame. And here's the interesting thing. Daniel uses the word shame, embarrassment, guilt, a word of conscience. And in our day and age, it's believed that we should not use a word like that, not to feel guilty. But see, I believe this. I believe there's bad guilt. You say, what do you mean by that? Where an insecure person feels guilty about everything, And the enemy uses that to shame them, keep them down. And then I think there's good guilt where you go, man, I messed up. It it impacts me on an internal level. Like, I, I should respond to that. That's healthy. If you lose that, that's dangerous. You see, because as you go along as a Christian, here's the thing. You become the A Spurgeon. Say, what do you mean by that? Charles Spurgeon used to say this. Christian ministers... Have a mind like a scholar, skin like a rhinoceros, and a heart like a dove. Here's what I've learned as I've been a Christian now for a little while. Over time, here's the natural thing, a lazy mind. Oh, I've already heard this. I read that book. I know what that guy's about to say. Instead of leaning into a message, you start to lean back. That's the natural thing to do. And then also this, a thin skin and a hard heart where you've been so wounded now because you've gotten a little bit older, you've been through some stuff, that you start to think everyone's the bad boyfriend. And you have a bad boyfriend syndrome. Well, my last pastor was bad, or my last business partner was bad, or my last spouse was bad, so you're bad. And you project your past on your present, and you never move forward. You have a thin skin and a hard heart. That is the natural thing that's coming for you as a believer. What will happen to you naturally over time is a lazy mind, thin skin, and a hard heart. Because people are mean. Because the world is chaotic. Because sin is in the world. But listen to me. It doesn't have to be your story. You stick and stay with Jesus, you'll find out there's so much about this book that I don't know yet. I want to lean in more. Ah, the mind of a scholar. Gosh, you know, I know that hurt people hurt people. So I don't necessarily have to take every criticism and every dynamic and go, oh, maybe that's their issue, not mine. I can have a little bit of a rhino skin. And maybe when there is something that needs to change, you can go, okay, Lord, search me, know me. That's where you want to stay. But you can't get away from it daily. Don't you wish there was a church that had this program called Daily in the Word that would help you live daily? Because that's how the Christian life is lived. You can't live on yesterday's manna. Yesterday is done. Listen to me. Let me have your attention. Yesterday is done. It's over. Don't rest on your laurels. If I can say this with as much humility as I possibly can, no one cares about what you did yesterday. Who are you today? And what is your hope for tomorrow? Are you living today? Today. Are you alive? Are you focused? Are you leaning in? Is today the joy of the Lord your strength? Let go of yesterday and don't live for tomorrow. It may never, ever come. Yesterday I was in a situation where there was this little mom and this little husband. They weren't little. They were just normal people. But like they were just they had one daughter who was little. And the daughter was not really listening, which I, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but like the daughter wasn't listening. 
And so the mom, mom was great. She had so many one-liners. I was like, man, I'm going to take some of those one-liners. But she just kept calling the girl love. No love, no love, no love. And I was like, hey, can I just ask a quick question? Is this little girl's name love? She goes, yeah, it is. Like, well, that's awesome. I have a love. But it's her middle name. Her middle name, she just had a birthday. Her name is Layla Patricia Love. And I didn't go down all these stories, but it reminded me of this dynamic. <sighs> Layla is named after Daisy. Daisy Love, who died at nine. And from age, I don't know, six to nine, lived through terrible cancer dynamics and treatments. And Daisy's in heaven. I'll never forget one time her dad telling me a story that Taylor Swift, at that time Taylor wasn't like she is now, but she was like, she was in town for something and she'd heard about Daisy's story and so she wanted Daisy to come backstage and meet Taylor. And I love this sweet little girl. She goes, Taylor, is she related to Hudson Taylor? Because they had raised her like, you know, in Bible stuff, not so much Taylor stuff. And so she didn't even know who Taylor Swift was. She thought she was meeting like a, an, like a descendant of Hudson Taylor. And so Daisy was super stoked. And then she met this singer. Um, <laughs> and so it was like not that impressive to her because she's just a singer, you know. Um, but it was a very interesting story, but it reminded me of this. Daisy's in heaven. So will you one day be, if your faith is in Jesus. When is that coming for you? I don't know. Could be soon, could be not. One of my youth pastors used to tell me this, Neil, life is short, but it's also long. You don't know what today looks like, but also you should live in such a way that you might live for a while. Well, that sounded like wisdom to me. Life is short, but it's also long. So maybe I should live in such a way. Let me put this up on the screen. Sin. Sin always takes you farther than you wanted to go. Sin always keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. And sin always costs more than you wanted to pay. Let me share with you some of the three best words you can ever use in marriage. I was wrong. These are some of the three best words in, in relationships. To be able to say, I made a mistake. I didn't do that right. Do you, did you read Daniel 9, 5 through 15? That's what he's saying. God, we blew it. We blew it. But you're good. And let's just wrap up with these last two. I'm going to read verses 16 through 19. And both in 16 and 19, you see this dynamic of both intercession and glory. Look at verse 16. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn, turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations, they mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. Oh, God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. Oh, my God. Lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. And we make this plea. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. This is the glory piece. Not because we deserve help. But because of your mercy. It's because of who you are, God. Hear, forgive, listen, and act. For your own sake, God's glory. Do not delay Oh, my God, for your people and your city, bear your name. Sometimes prayers can be a bit like this. Where you're just throwing bubbles up. And I think that, I mean, I think God will, you know, any genuine prayer, God's going to hear. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I also think that as a believer... You want your house of prayer to be built. And you can't rest on yesterday. Man, last year I had a great prayer journal. This year, what's today look like? Praise. Confession. Intercession. Did you see there in his intercessory prayer? What do you mean by intercession? Just praying on behalf of others. You've heard this before, right? How do you diffuse spiritual depression? Well, one of the ways is to do something nice for someone else 
And I'll give you 10 steps. Well, number one, do something nice for someone else and then repeat that nine times. That'll help. Eyes off you. You might be living yodge when you're supposed to be living joy. Jesus, others you. Not you, others Jesus. You're yodgy. No wonder it's not working out. You need to be joy. Jesus, others. Jesus, others. God, you take care of me. Jesus, others. Praying for others releases us from the prison of self-absorption. And you live in a culture that values self-absorption. Remember, you're being shaped. You were conceived, you were born, and you're constantly being shaped by the family you're from, the culture you're in, and the stories you're being told. You know that social media is about storytelling, right? You're constantly being shaped. And an egocentric life is miserable. A Christocentric life is beautiful. When we choose to lead a life of prayer that's centered upon praise and confession and intercession in God's glory, we can live controlled in the midst of chaos. I'm a weird person. I always try to think, how can this relate to Laney? Laney, pray upwards, praise. Make sure it's a bit inward, confession. Make sure it's outwards, about others. And once again, make sure it's upwards, God's glory. Up. In, out, up. Up, in, out, up. And here's what you'll do. You'll be a little bit stronger than this. But you'll start to build a house of prayer in your own life. 